Uh, so let's start right away. Uh, Lucas is a postdoctoral researcher at the Max Planck Institute for uh, Psycholinguistics, and he will talk about uh, uh, lifelong learning for evolving graphs. So this is uh, a pretty, I would say, new topic, and I look forward to, to your talk. So please, Lucas, the stage is yours. Yes, thank you very much. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, and um, yeah, the topic today, as I said, is a lifelong learning in the graph domain for evolving graphs. And I uh, find that particularly interesting since uh, evolving graphs uh, appear at many places in the wild, or at least, let's say, in the, in the internet, or in publication metadata graphs, in knowledge graphs, social media, or even uh, financial uh, transaction graphs. And in particular, we consider the, the problem of, of classifying each node. For example, um, classifying a research paper into medicine or computer science. Um, but we also have the problem that at, uh, there are frequently new classes coming up. Like, for instance, um, when there was COVID um, hitting the world, and then it took uh, almost a year until the uh, concept or the class COVID was introduced in the, in the formal thesauri of, of medical literature. So we need to adapt. And um, for the context of this talk, we will focus on graph neural networks in the, as a model. I will not go into much detail, but it's a very popular model to, to tackle node classification in, in, in graphs, in static graphs. All right. So what are the specific challenges of evolving graphs and what are the high level goals that we pursue here? Um, so first of all, the nodes are actually not independent from each other because they are by, by definition connected to each other through edges in the graph. And um, moreover, the, the distribution of the class given um, node features and, and the graph adjacency A uh, changes over time. Plus we have even new classes coming. So in, in two ways, it, it violates sort of the, the ID assumption. It's not identically distributed and uh, it's not independent from each other. And third, third issue is that we have very practical uh, lim uh, limitations of GPU memory. So if you've ever worked with graph neural networks, unfortunately, most of them uh, uh, assume that they could can put the entire graph just in the GPU memory. And uh, when you want to work with, with large scale data, uh, that doesn't work anymore. There are techniques for batching, but it's much, much more complicated than if you have independent examples. Let's say. So what we want is some kind of learning system that continually adapts to new data, automatically detects the, uh, new classes, and uses as little past data as possible. So for this talk, I'm, uh, I'm going to come through three uh, topics and papers. Um, the first one is yeah, a very basic starting point, like how do we do incremental training with graphs, and um, but also focusing on the specific aspect of whether it's it's helpful to you reuse an existing model for for the next time step versus uh, just train a new one from scratch. So and uh, basically for forward transfer. Then next uh, we will see how we can detect new classes. And uh, last uh, part will be about how, how we can use the graph structure to Im improve this out of distribution detection. Okay, let's start with the first topic. So as, as spoiled already, so the approach is very, very simple. So we, we just uh, split the graph into snapshots um, based, on, based on time. So we have here um, publication metadata graph. So the so publication year essentially determines uh, the task in which a particular um, document faults, and the connections between the nodes are citations, for example. So, and, and what do we do? We, we keep a memory for replay, and this memory is determined by a certain history size that is just a, a, a time span, essentially, of, of a couple of years. We will investigate it in, in more detail. And um, if there is a new class appearing in the training data, of course, uh, then we, we adapt the output layer and make it a bit larger. Okay, so this is a basic framework that will go through all, all three topics. And we might extend it step by step. So data sets that we compiled um, are based on, on, two are based on DBAP, so computer science uh, uh, publications, and the edges are cit citations. 
Um, as a class, we just use the, the um, most published uh, um, the venues in which there were the most papers published, um, which is of course a proxy for the for the topic. Uh, but we also made sure manually that there is not too much overlap. We have one other data set uh, on pharmacological and, and biological uh, papers, which is an, a co-authorship graph, but it doesn't have uh, any new classes. So let's see how it turns out on the three data sets. Um, and, and what we find consistently is that uh, we only get a gain from reusing the past model or the previous model when, when the history size is small. Uh, so let's say, or, or there's at least a relationship, the smaller the history size, the more use we get out, out of the uh, reusing the model. So there's a kind of trade-off between implicit knowledge in the model parameters and explicit knowledge, uh, which uh, of course also determines how much memory we want to, to allocate for this uh, um, streaming scenario. But another interesting finding was that, of course, this is limited to these publication metadata uh, data sets, but that medium uh, history sizes of just three or four years are, are sufficient to maintain like a high level of accuracy. So that would be uh, around 95% relative compared to retraining on the full graph. And what you see here in the plot, I should have said this probably earlier, on the left um, in, each, in each cell is uh, the average accuracy. And on the right is the forward transfer. So the difference to a randomly initialized model trained from scratch just for this task. And there, the red numbers are the, what I said that you, you really see it when the history size is small. All right. Um, for this table, we had assumed that we just get everything from the past available as the ground truth when we want to train for the next or everything with the limited resource size. Um, but of course, it may not always be the case that suddenly we have the ground truth in the real world uh, as soon as we advance to the next year. Uh, so we also investigated a case where we have just a, a, a label rate um, of uh, so a fraction of nodes that come with labels and the rest will never get ground truth labels. And um, again here, so the x-axis is not the time, it is this label rate. So we start with only 10% labels available up to 90% and um, see how the, the relationship between cold and warm starts. So warm start reusing previous model, cold start from scratch um, compares to each other and how this relates to the history size and uh, the, the picture is similar. You can see an advantage in general for reusing the previous model, uh, at least in history sizes one and, and three. And afterwards, yeah, so the, the red line here, the 25 is like the, the full graph, 25 years. So there you actually don't see any, any advantage. Okay, so that was uh, the first step of bringing uh, continual learning to graphs. Um, but now we also want to detect uh, out of distribution cases, so uh, new classes that appear on the fly. And uh, we want to do this in an unsupervised way. And before, they were, they were even considered for evaluation, but the model had little chance to actually uh, predict them because they were never in the, in the training set before. Um, okay, so we looked at the data and, and saw that um, there are new classes, but not so much. So the majority is, is still uh, known classes. It does not change uh, so quickly. And the plot here, the, the red small bars are the, the, unseen, the, the nodes that are from unseen classes. And uh, so this is a challenging problem to um, determine in an unsupervised way. So where uh, we, we again started from, from the uh, lifelong learning literature, of course, and modified the approach to deep open classification, which was originally de um, developed for text classification. But just we switch out a few things. We use, of course, a, a graph neural network uh, to, to work on our data and um, binary cross entropy training is uh, uh, yeah, it was also used before, but we had, had to adjust it for, for class imbalance, as you will see in the results. But the general idea of this technique is if, if all segment outputs uh, fall below a certain threshold, we just reject to, to classify the node and, and label it as out of distribution. And um, yeah, how, how it fits together in the, in the general framework is that we 
do it on the side. So we, we still do the normal classification, but we have a switch. And uh, if the out of distribution detector tells us, okay, reject to classify, then it is gets an artificial out of distribution label. And otherwise it gets just uh, the maximum predicted label as before. And um, yeah, we ran quite a few experiments on that, uh, also with varying like thresholds and, and risk reduction, what I uh, will not go into detail here. Um, but the, the general pattern was that uh, it is beneficial to have a high threshold and that uh, risk reduction does not help. And most importantly, that, uh, that it's very important to adjust the loss function for, for class imbalance, which was, uh, you can see on the table on the right in the in the first uh, row, um, like thirteen times better than than not using uh, the class imbalance adjusted version, which is marked here as DOC, and the adjusted version is GDOC. All right. Um, oh yes, uh, binary versus categorical transentropy. So we had to switch for the out of distribution detection the loss function. Um, and one important thing to note is also that it does um, harm the, the normal classification results a bit, but on the other side, of course, you, you get, uh, get a bit of advantage uh, that you have a more robust system that can also detect when there is an out-of-distribution case. I'm a bit looking at the time, because, so I will move over that quickly, but if you have questions in the end, I'm happy to go uh, deeper into that. The last uh, topic I want to mention is uh, whether um, the graph structure can improve the out of distribution detection. So uh, going back to the figure before, we just add one more line. So the out of distribution detector module can now also uh, use the graph structure. And this idea um, was, was an idea of, of a, a student, Marcel Hoffmann in the top right, you see an image. The key idea is to smooth the UUD scores by averaging over adjacent nodes. And this can be controlled by a neighbor influence parameter. And uh, the pattern in the results, um, there's more in the paper, but uh, just to illustrate here, is that uh, you uh, usually can get better than having zero uh, neighbor influence. So that uh, uh, shows uh, the usefulness, uh, especially on Cora, you can see it. Um, but also on the other data sets, the peak is always somewhere higher than zero, which, which means that the smoothing of the neighbors helps. So in summary, we have seen incremental training algorithm for graph neural networks, this trade-off between explicit and implicit knowledge that on these data sets, high level of accuracy can be retrained, retained. And um, one important thing was that the out of distribution detection is sensitive to class imbalance. And what we've just seen that graph smoothing can improve out of distribution scores. What I um, think would be interesting for the future, one thing that we are also currently working on is, is out of distribution generalization. So essentially zero shot learning, where you usually have little opportunities, but in a graph, there are certain tricks you can, can employ like propagating labels or, or so. And um, another thing that, that was in my mind for a long time already, but I didn't get anything to work, but maybe some one of you does, is um, to have, to have a more sophisticated approach to what data to keep in memory for replay. So we just used a very simple uh, technique to start time-based cutoff, but of course you could think of techniques for learning kind of representative summary graph or something like this. I think I've seen something in that area uh, recently, but uh, so exciting. And yeah, in general, uh, it's, it's, um, it's a very interesting uh, problem to work on. And uh, there are many ways to, either transfer more standard lifelong learning techniques or develop new ones that leverage the, the graph structure. And um, yeah, with that, I want to thank my collaborators, Marcel, uh, Jacopo, Benedict, Tobias, and Danska. I have tried to put QR codes uh, if you want to check the papers or the data sets that are all public or the code. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to, to answer them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucas. That was a very interesting talk. Uh, I guess we have time for a very quick question, uh, if someone has one, otherwise I can uh, I can ask one. Okay, so um, I actually tried to, to work uh, a few years ago on continual learning and graphs. It was very interesting and challenging also. 
And uh, in, in my experience, your last uh, point, the, the last point you addressed in this talk was super, super interesting, like how to make the model uh, exploit the structure of the graph, right? Because often in continual learning, we deal with very simple tasks. Like each task is very, very simple. And so the model can easily cheat. Like, uh, I don't care about the structure. I'll just take the features of the node in a multi-layer perceptron and, uh, and uh, yeah. Yeah, use that yeah. to, to, learn, to learn the task. Then of course you fail in continual learning, but you can learn the single task uh, pretty well. So I, I don't know if you have any, any general thoughts about that. Like, is, is it worth comparing with a multilayer perceptron? Because if we do, then the risk that the multilayer perceptron is getting a very large accuracy, uh, perhaps the same as a graph network in, in each task taken, uh, taken alone is, is not small. So. Uh, I don't know, what's the experimental setup you would like to to have here? Yes, I would absolutely encourage everyone to use so always use a um, multi-layer perceptron baseline and just to see if, if the graph is really necessary. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, actually a, a crucial thing in mm -hmm. a different line of work. Uh, people have been trying to, to push graph neural networks for text classification, um, but there we we did exactly this, that we pulled out the uh -huh. MLP, and it was better than all the uh, other approaches <laughs> that, uh, yeah, that yeah. Well, they, they made an artificial graph out of the text, and then they put that into the graph network. So they didn't use like extra information like citations also. As, so the, as soon as they have citation or some kind of extra information in the graph, that, that usually also helps. Um, and here in the, in, 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 I think in these papers, we always also have the MLP baseline and there is a, is a margin. But um, okay. anyone working on this, I would encourage to just try it out. It is uh, uh, sometimes surprising. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, I was surprised myself. I mean, I'm not an expert on graphs, so I was expecting the graphs just to destroy everything and yeah. the multi-layer perception were quite good. Oh, uh, okay. Valid, yeah. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucas, for, 